The phone, the com- the laptop. I try to mitigate it with like blue light blockers and everything, F flux, all that. But yeah, we just don't have alternatives. Yeah. But now we do. Yeah, yeah. It's um. I think it's interesting how simple the problem is, yet how long it's taken for the first solutions to show up. It kind of reminds me of, um, there's like an anecdote about why the hardest things in technology are the social things, are the value systems, or the coordination problems. Like the example given was, we're going to have artificial general intelligence before we have a non-QWERTY keyboard. <laughs> Which is insane. And if you know anything about ergonomics, QWERTY it makes like no ergonomic sense. Like you look at typing speed, carpal tunnel, whatever, whatever, like your fingers are doing all sorts of weird stuff. It's just not, if you were to work backwards from the way your fingers worked, you would not come up with QWERTY. And if you want to know how, <laughs> why QWERTY is the way it is, take out your phone and type the word typewriter in and just see where your finger goes. Believe it or not, QWERTY is built such that the word typewriter is entirely on the top row. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had no idea. Try it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just envisioning the letters. I'm like, I don't think that's correct, but it is. No, it doesn't make no, sense. You're like, wait, there's a Q. How is that? <laughs> but you actually sit there. And the reason that is the case is QWERTY was invented by a certain typewriter company mm. whose entire value prop is our typewriter does not get jammed when you do too many strokes on the same row. Hmm. That's what used to happen. Typewriters had different rows. You go up, 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 up. But you do too many keys on the same row, and they all, all the different things smack into each other. Wow. And so literally, all of us are sitting here with a little bit more carpal tunnel than we need to because some typewriter salesman wanted a shtick to say, look, dot, 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 type all of typewriter. And the fact that we're so close to these insane advances in AI and so on. And yet this simple low-hanging fruit of QWERTY, we're still going to have that here. That really speaks to if you care about changing technology, if you care about solving these systemic, fundamental, and you could even say simple problems, they're not technology problems. We're literally creating God Hmm. talking about AI. And we're doing that before we can solve a social problem, which is if I make a non-QWERTY keyboard, every school needs to teach non-QWERTY. Well, no one's going to do that because there's no keyboards that are not QWERTY. And you're not going to teach for a keyboard that doesn't exist. So just like, how do you solve that? And this is a really long-winded way of saying it. we could have solved the blue light, the flicker, the ergonomics, the distraction, all these aspects of computing so long ago. It's not a technology problem. Yes, we've done a lot of work. Yes, it's taken years of inventing. I don't want to like sell myself short, but the truth of the matter is, is it's a social problem. It's a value system problem. The people who make these technologies, they just do not appreciate how much health matters. They just do not appreciate how much like your cognitive sovereignty, mindfulness, being able to actually have agency, control where your attention is going, and therefore everything in your life. They just don't get it. Oh, why would you want to give up colors? Why would you want to give up that? Why would you want to give up the sex appeal of this beautiful screen? And so to me, what's really powerful with this next generation of companies is we're not starting from a supply chain. We're not starting from technology. We're not starting from, oh, we could do this cool technical thing. We're starting from saying what matters to us in what order? What's our values? What are our priorities? What's our philosophy? What's the world we want our children to grow up in? And then what are the social coordination problems that ultimately change the technological primitives? What are those and how do we start that? And that's the way I look at daylight. That's the way I look at our current product, what has coming on the roadmap, which is what's like the social coordination problems that solve, like that get in the way of this. And just a simple example, like we made it flicker free. So you can use blue blockers, but that's not going to stop flicker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can get into the science of Flickr or why it matters and this and that. But so many people could do a Flickr free backlight. It's an older technology to do DC dimming, which is uh, you don't use PWM or Flickr to change the brightness of backlight. You literally change the voltage. The difficulty, though, is it's a social coordination problem. 
every engineer only knows how to work with PWM circuits. So they're like, what are you doing? DC dimming, this is old. Uh, you're like, well, it's better for people's health. But they're like, uh, but there's variability between LED to LED. And now we need to write three different drivers and the firmware is this. And then you go to the supply chain and they're like, oh, we don't have drivers for this anymore. You're like, yeah. Well, okay, let's go do that. Okay, you finally find something that's there, but now the software is not written for that. You got to figure out the software for that. And somebody needs to warranty it. And they're like, well, we don't really warranty this anymore. Now, every LED is slightly different. So if I put the brightness slider like here on this tablet, it might be 10 nits bright. I put it in the same place on this other bright, and it's going to be 11 nits bright. Some product manager somewhere who controls that software is going to lose their shit. Oh, my God, I can't control what the user experience is. So everywhere through the whole thing, there's a simple thing of, guys, let's get rid of Flickr. But the actual reality is it's not a technology problem that's hard. It's every layer there's a social coordination problem. Yeah. And um, I don't know how I got onto this, but I think there is this, like, reframe that if we want to make a difference – and these fundamental primitives of modern life and technology being one of them, we got to start with what are the social coordination problems at their core. Well, that's a hell of an intro. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I know there's definitely a story behind what, what inspired you to do all of this because you mentioned things like um, kids living in a healthy world. Uh, that's diminishing. Um, just looking at my younger siblings, I kind of – stop myself from yelling at them because they don't know better. It's just kind of what's available. And then I look at my life and the way I grew up, and it was like parks on the weekend, um, a lot of beach getaways, even beach nights where we just go out barefoot, go on the sand, come back home. You know, you've kind of witnessed every spectrum of the light for the day. Um, and I just find it intriguing and I think the the question we want to ask you is essentially what is the story behind what because uh, I'm, I'm sensing some anger so <laughs> 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 is that obvious <laughs> yeah, yeah I kind of want to I mean it's good because it it means you're passionate about whatever the idea is behind the daylight computer and I kind of just want to know the background of what really inspired you to get into it. I appreciate your sensitivity to even bring that up because I um, I think it is so much more romantic of a story if you're like, find the bad people, shoot them, and the world gets better. Solve the hard technical problem and the world gets better. It was so much more heartbreaking to be like, wait, what the fuck? Like, we could all have flicker-free stuff and it's just because of all this social bullshit because it's hard to argue this when you're a project manager at Apple like that's the reason we're all like what mm -hmm. and I think that's the heartbreak it, it wouldn't be as heartbreaking if it was like oh we just need a genius to invent this oh we just need one more of that it's like dude it's all here it's all here and I think that's what this has been a story of is a story of heartbreak of realizing oh my god so many of us are struggling and suffering for totally arbitrary reasons. And um, it just breaks my heart because I don't think I'm that special. I don't think what we're doing is at the level of some absolutely mad genius invention. Um, we just put things that were laying around together and we had the pain tolerance to stick with it for long enough until it made it somewhere. And the story is just of asking a simple question, like, does it have to be this way? Does technology have to be this way? Do I have to feel so bad using this? Do I have to ruin my sleep? Do I have to feel every time that I go and open a new tab when I'm trying to do something productive and I'm on ESPN for 40 minutes that, like, I don't deserve success in this life because I suck. And uh, the hope was I don't need to suck this much, you know? Every time I forget to put blue blockers on, instead of being like, well, I deserve to have shitty sleep because I'm not conscientious enough, it's like, well, 
what if I didn't need to be a particular way to have a better life? You know, James Clear of Atomic Habits fame says, like, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. How do we change the systems and environments around us such that we're the better, best versions of ourselves, healthier, more productive, more calm? And that was the hope uh, of starting this is I needed a story to tell myself that I could have a better life. Because whether I was a manager at Chick-fil-A or doing a hedge fund or running marketing campaigns, every interface with the world was through a computer. And I was terrified at the prospect. That means I was going to be incompetent at everything. That means I was always going to be miserable. I was always going to be unhealthy. And I don't mean to act like the computer is a source of all my mental health and physical health struggles, but it's the fact that we spend 10 hours a day on it, day after day after day, that it impacts you. And so you could argue, I started this not because I was like, I need a device that does X, Y, Z. I needed to tell myself a story of hope that, hey, if you had better technology, if you had a better computer, maybe you won't be a fuck up. Maybe you'll be okay. Maybe you won't, every time you try to write something, spend three hours on YouTube going down a rabbit hole out of some escapism, right? Because I, uh, I don't know if I'm, whatever. And um, I think it's that, 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 that story of hope meeting a story of heartbreak, which was like, wait a minute. Like, this stuff exists. <laughs> Japanese professors have been working on these problems for decades and no one's looked at it. Like, it doesn't even take the immense amounts of money. People would be like, oh, it's going to cost you $100 million to redo a computer. <laughs> right? We did it for one-tenth of the cost. It's still a lot of money. But we're like, dude, if we actually listened to these people that we, like, looked up to, this wouldn't exist. I, I could show you some emails of this woman who's, like, a legend in the display industry. And she literally wrote back to me saying... I'm only, I'm, I'm probably the only person nice enough to tell you this, but there's no way this is going to work. This is a bad idea and you're wasting your life. And I was like, would you be able to like take me out to coffee and just tell me what? She's like, nope, I'm nice enough to reply flat out, no chance. <laughs> and so I sent her an email recently with a screenshot of the thing. And I said, hey, I'm glad I didn't listen to you. Look what we have here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, the, it's that heartbreak of... I, uh, I'm just rebellious, you know, so for better or worse, I don't like listening to authority. Um, call it mommy issues that my mom had a controlling mom. Uh, but if, if that wasn't the case, if I didn't have a psychological predisposition that's often maladaptive, but happened to be helpful in this case, this wouldn't have happened. Because who am I to not listen to somebody who raised tens of millions of dollars and invented a new display technology as well? So she's the last person to do it, and she did it in 2008. So... Um, maybe you wanted something more specific, but it's just this two like DNA strands of like the want for hope. And then also the heartbreak of, oh my God, this can't be real. Like all of us could have had this. Like I didn't need to need this hope if a couple people were a little more brave. If a couple people were willing to accept something that was, you know, less shiny, but better for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's where the anger comes from is there's a book that says, if you see an angry man, give him a hug. He's crying. Uh, inside. I think that's a lot of the cases. The anger comes from heartbreak and the heartbreak comes from anger and so on and so on. And it's good. Like I, I definitely share the the sentiment with the whole anger part because I mean, when you look around, especially for, for the landscape of health, like it's, it's terrible from every angle. And what I find tragic is that nobody is considering the importance of light. And this is certainly what a lot of my work is focused around. And it's, I've only been focused on it for the past year or so, ever since I came across Cruz and, and a few other people. But like th this piece of technology that you have here that you have actually manifested, I think can have some serious, some seriously positive consequences for, for the rest of the world, especially for children, like you mentioned, because nobody is focused on this. Nobody has any idea what artificial light does to our, our biology, period. And so I, I do have to commend you on, on just bringing this to, to light. It's just, uh, it's incredible in my mind. And like for you, what would you say the biggest obstacle has been so far throughout the whole process? Because you've been at this since 2018, right? Yeah, it's been a while. Well, first, I, I, I want to thank you because it's only, it's only possible because educators like yourself are pioneering 
this domain that people like me can then fulfill the need. I could come out and say blue light free computer and it would mean nothing to nobody if it wasn't for folks like yourself saying, guys, this matters. So in many ways, you could argue that you guys are the leaders and we're, we're following. And I, I deeply appreciate the role you play. Um, I think there's three ways I think about light. One is my personal struggles, um, seasonal affective disorder and so on. The second is if you really break a computer down to the most like basic elements of what it is, is it's light, it's touch, and it's sound. And so if you want to reinvent computing, you got to start with light. At the end of the day, that's what a computer is. Something you touch that then gives you information back in the form of light and sometimes sound. And then the third way I think about light is kind of to your point, this isn't just about a bit of melatonin suppression. This is about metabolic dysfunction. This is about your dopamine pathways. This is about, um, I forget the name of the doctor. It's an Australian uh, dentist, uh, Jalal Khan, I think. Mm, yeah. Where he says, um, he says, people don't understand the depth in which circadian dysfunction affects people. Imagine if everybody in London, their watches were all different. It'd be total chaos when it comes to catching a train. And he says, that's what's happening in our body when we're having blue light and other these things that are causing circadian misalignments is like the different clocks in the body. It's like everybody in London's on a different time. No one's catching the train. And so in, in real life, we call that chaos. And chaos in the body, we call inflammation. Hmm. And so his point is, that's the depth in which circadian misalignment is affecting people. And so I spent my time at Stanford uh, working on medical devices, I come from a family of doctors. I've always wanted to have impact in health. Um, I didn't have the patience to go to med school or anything like that. So this is the way I thought I could have impact. And um, I think the call to arms is, oh, wow, you can have a huge amount of impact on health if somebody believes the behavior change required because they listen to people like yourself and then they can buy products, whether it's light bulbs or computers like ours, that eliminate junk light, that make it possible to spend more time in full spectrum natural light in the sun. And third, and that's, we're doing a little bit of it now, but hope to do more in the future, is give people healing light. Because one of the cool things we did is we invented a custom backlight. It's a rare thing. And so we can actually put non-visible infrared LEDs in there such that when you're using it, you're also getting photobiomodulation. Right now we get a little bit of 720 nanometer, uh, just a tiny amount, but in future generations we can get 760 and 860 and 1064 and so on. And so in a way, you could not just be removing what's bad, but actually helping people without them having to go sit in front of something. They've just been doing their Sudoku on this, right? Or doing their email. Mm. And so I think of light in terms of the health impact that we can have at scale, because that's personally for me, something I'm motivated by. It's a bit ego driven. It's like my dad's helped like 10,000 people in his life. Like I'm going to help more, bro. Like, And so I think that's one way it, Jack calls it like brain surgery without a scalpel. Yeah. Um, the second way is, yeah, if you want to start from a blank slate and reinvent computing, you got to start with light and touch and sound. And so I decided to start with light because that's the thing that – that's a computer. That's a computer. Whether it's VR, AR, any of these things, they're all modulations of light. And so if the basis for a computer is based on flawed principles that are not working backwards from human physiology, that are not working backwards from evolutionary principles, the entire castle on top of it is moot. It's flawed. And it's only going to get worse with the Vision Pro and VR and stuff like that. You're just putting that on your face for the rest of the day and put that on your child's face for the rest of their lives. Good luck. And so to me, if you want a future of computing that's healthier and more humane, is not about AI. It's not about some new fancy 32 gigs of RAM M3 MacBook. It's about how do we improve light, touch, and sound, and then the layers on top of it, which are like ergonomics and EMFs and everything else. 
And then the first one is simply, I have very severe seasonal affective disorder. It only started to happen to me after I was 18. So every winter I get really depressed. I, um, I didn't know this until I finally worked with a psychiatrist because I was so desperate, but uh, I had something like 16 depressive episodes in 12 years. Wow. And um, so once again, it was a story of hope was to be able to spend time outside. That was the only way I could feel a little bit better. That's the only way I felt like I had some chance of playing a role in the story. And so to me, a computer that I couldn't use outside was literally killing me. And so um, that's why the company is called Daylight. It's not just because you can use a computer outside in the sun. It's, it's a source of hope. It was the right, like, when that equinox would hit and I knew the days were getting longer, like, that was hope. Yeah. And every year was like, I can't wait until I get to December 22nd or whatever it may be. And that's the hope with, with this company is start with the foundational primitives and create a little space for hope and just take that space and make it a little bigger and make it a little bigger. Before we know it, we might have something interesting in a couple of years. I think we will. 100%. What's your perspective? I'm, I'm very interested in... Well, you, you know me. Um, I'm in the editing room a lot. And um, I, I feel really similar to how you behave during winter just because it's the lack of uh, sunlight to begin with, lack of outside. And I feel like that's my season when I'm really inside. And it's not because of the rain. It's just this... I'm seasonally busy during that time, mostly in the editing room. So when I heard about the daylight computer, my my thing was, okay, we're not chasing the M3 super fast speeds, the GPU speeds that um, I would particularly need for me to use this tool called the computer, right? Because for me, like many others, it's my income is driven by sitting on a computer. And that's when I started to imagine what, how do I say this? I think I was thinking more of display. Obviously colors are very important for what I do. And would that limit me in any way? That's what I'm not too sure about. Yeah, how, how does that work? Yeah. Can, can I, you find a workaround? Can I see if I'm understanding the question? You're asking, the first version of what we have is a black and white display. Yes. Is that going to stop somebody who's Le, reading yeah. a biology textbook of a mitochondria or you as an editor? Like a Kindle, like yeah. my Kindle. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you're, you're right. This first version is not going to work for everybody and everything. And I think in many ways, that's the humility required to make something because there's the sheer complexity of computing. If you're trying to cover all the different pieces of software people need, if you're trying to cover all the use cases, it's just impossible. Mm. So in many ways, by trying to just take a little small corner of computing and just going all in on something that's really small, it's actually possible for a small group of people to do something about it. So yes, our first one's black and white. It's very minimalist. It's essentially a digital piece of paper, right? Like a tablet is a fat piece of paper. That's really what it is. Mm. You can take notes, you can put a keyboard to it and type, you can read on it. Um, you know, you can, if you decide you want to watch Peppa the Pig on black and white because <laughs> your kid's still yelling at you, then you can do that. But the reality is there is no intrinsic reason the type of screen technology we're pioneering, they're called reflective displays or paper like displays. They don't emit light. Conventional displays are emissive displays, they bounce light. Hmm. So, you can see this table right here because the light is bouncing off of it into our eyes. If we turn off the lights, you can't see the table. Um, it's the same thing with these type of displays. So you can actually make these displays color, and we do actually have a color prototype that we're developing. It's just a little bit out. It just takes more money. Um, it's good. We're going to have it in a couple of years. Gotcha. So if you come to San Francisco, I can, I can show it to you. And the reality is we're not just thinking about the hardware aspects of it. We're thinking about the software aspects. And the way I describe it to the team is it's going to take a lot of responsibility and skill to use color properly. Mm. And what I mean by that is the current way people use color in software is to take advantage of you, to take advantage of evolutionary mismatches. Mm. When you see something red, 
It's because it's danger. It's a berry. It's something you got to do. So they put red notification bubbles all over the place because they want your attention. That's, true. That's how they get paid, right? And so everywhere you look, I could get using dark patterns of where they gray something out and make something else blue and that. It all exists to force your psychologies in ways that are beneficial to them. Mm. And those patterns go so deep when you hire a new designer, they don't even realize that this is not reality. This is one way of designing. And so there is a discipline to black and white of having to start over all of software design and be forced to be functional because you, you can't be manipulative in the same way in black and white. Mm -hmm. And as we build capacity in designing a new operating system, as we build capacity in how to make software in a way that's more empowering, that's a bit abstract. I don't even know what that means, but I do know what principles underlie it. I think then as we do a good job with black and white, and then we do a good job with black, white, and one color, maybe green, mm -hmm. um, we can slowly start to build the capacity to do a good job with everything. And so that's a long way of saying like, yeah, give it a couple of years, we'll do Final Cut Pro on our thing. Clearly we're not Apple, we're not gonna have OS X, but we'll have a monitor, so you put that to your MacBook. Um, if you're using our future phone, damn right that if we do have color, we're not going to be using it the same way to hijack your attention. Yeah. And so the analogy that comes to mind is um, you go to Staples, and you buy highlighters, damn are those saturated, right? Like when you start highlighting something on the page, you don't see anything else. All you see is this fucking hot pink or <laughs> green yeah. or whatever the hell it yeah. is. You go to Japan and you try these highlighters called the uh, mild liners. I don't know. Have you guys ever tried these? No, never. I've never seen them. No. They're, they're awesome. They're just like totally desaturated colors that don't blow out everything else. So if the Staples thing is like screaming in your face pink, this one is like a barely there pink. Oh. But it helps you notice that text a little bit more without drowning everything else okay. out. That to me is a responsible use of color. Yeah. And it's in that ethos. Once again, it's the same principles. Let's work backwards from the way the human body and mind and spirit works and design our technologies and systems with that in place. Dang. I mean, that really puts it into perspective because, uh, like, color coding is really around us for everything. So there's the color for danger in cinematography. You can identify if something bad is going to happen in a movie based off of color. Mm -hmm. And it's the same concept that goes, hey, Windows, did you know Norton is cybersecurity is yada, yada, yada? If you notice that, it's a specific color because it's a message warning you about something. And you leave your task, you go ahead and close it. And you're like, what was I doing? So it, it's it's a hijack. And people don't understand how these big companies manipulate their, their products. I mean, you could talk about big food, big tech. <laughs> it's the same concept across the board. They, it, and it's the misconception of thinking we, that they care about us, which is why they're supplying us with OS X. <laughs> Looks clean, man, minimal. Yeah, I mean, you basically have a mini casino in your hand. That's, I guess that's how you could put it. Um, and I see it across the board. I mean, older people, no, nobody's immune from this. The moment they get onto a piece of tech, it's over for the most part. I mean, I've seen grandparents being addicted to it six, seven, eight hours a day. Myself, young people, so. My mom sends me reels. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, aren't you supposed to be cooking? Like, which which there shows something else to do? Which shows how deeply entrenched this problem is and for somebody like you to come into the picture and even try to tackle it like that that I, I have so much respect for you as a person for even going down that route because I know that you probably have and quote-unquote enemies left and right trying to take you down around this thing I mean do do you agree with that do you have people like behind the scenes that are trying to basically just put this out of business yeah there's more I can say um off air than on air. Of course. That. <laughs> there are stories. There are stories. I, I would say it would be nice to be able to say the real problems are particular people blocking it. To me, the much scarier truth is it's systemic. To me, the scarier truth is there's so much cowardice. Hmm. To me, the scarier truth is a lot of these people are convinced they're doing good. It's the Hannah Arendt banality of evil. You don't really need to be afraid of evil people, she says, because they kind of go splat eventually. Somebody discovers they're evil. The real people you got to be really scared of are those who are absolutely convinced they're doing good because those people are so convincing to themselves and to others. And that's, I think, what's dangerous about all of this is you go meet the people at Apple and they're good people. 
They're absolutely convinced they're doing good. They are just so out of touch with what's real. They just live in their own reality. And guess what? They work 80 hours a week. They have no time. They don't have time to sit on a bus and be like, wait, no one's talking to each other. They have no time. And so I think (laughs) it's so obvious to normal people. It's so obvious. And it is so non-obvious to the people in these corporations. And what is the this I'm pointing to is the ways these things don't fulfill their promise. The ways these things hurt us. And um, I think the revolution is a psychological and philosophical one. And what I mean by that is like, bear with me, I'm going to use an analogy, hopefully it'll land, is you go to a store and you try on a pair of Allbirds, Allbird shoes, and they're so comfy and cushy. And you're like, oh, man, these are going to be like walking on pillows. This is going to be amazing, Right. And then you try a pair of Birkenstocks in the store and you're like, dude, this hurts. Like, what? Oh, it's stiff and it's like, I can get blisters on this. And if you make a decision based on your first simple surface experience there, you're going to pick all birds. Mm-hmm. They're simply the better in-store experience, so to speak. But take it nine months down the road, all the foam in that all birds is totally compacted. That shoe was best on day one and only gets worse. And now it's like unergonomic. It's not great for you. It's loose. But they got your money because it was great in the store. Now take that pair of Burks that was like, ugh, on the first day. Now that cork, that natural material is molded to your footbed. It's really comfortable. It's really good for you ergonomically. I might be wrong about that, but close enough. That, to me, is the philosophical and psychological change, is not just making purchase decisions based off the sex appeal, the glam, the what you see on the first day, the 10-second demo. It's willing to deal with the fact that those things might not be as comfortable on day one, but they're better for you six months in, nine months in, two years in, three years in. That's not a technological change. That's not an economic change. That's a psychology and philosophy change. That's growing up. Hmm. right? That's not just... Dating the person who looks amazing on day one, right? <laughs> it's the person who you feel great doing a five-hour layover at LAX with, right? It's, it's the long term. And I think in so much as people are choosing that in other areas of their life, with exercise, with their clothing, with the food they buy, there needs to be a sim- similar change for technology. And I, I like to argue that that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to build technology for grown-ups. It's not more RAM. It's not more colors. It's not more pixels. It looks uglier. You know, it's black and white to start. (laughs) You know, it's not as thin and sexy as an Apple thing. But we're saying grownups realize, hopefully, what matters is what matters. That's health. That's wellness. That's mindfulness. That's focus. That's actual true productivity in the things you intend to be productive in. And I don't know if it's going to work because... You know, a lot of people don't eat healthy because it's good for you. It's because they want a six pack, right? Like, I don't know what vanity we're playing to. I don't know if people will be that better version of themselves and pick that thing that is slightly worse in that moment or seems worse by spec or this, but is better for them long term. And so I like to say, like, we currently have junk food computing. What we're trying to create is like hummus computing. Hmm. I don't know. Sometimes in the party, everybody loves the Indian uncle who's given out candy. The Indian uncle that's giving out celery and hummus, like, bro, come on, man. Again? (laughs) Again. So who knows? Maybe it's too early. But the reason I'm here and love talking to folks like you is if there's any chance of it happening, it's because of us coming together and say this matters. We're not going to be cynical about people. We're not going to say they're going to be there being stupid and letting their lizard brain dominate. We're saying, no, no, no. People deserve to be the best versions of themselves and we're not going to pander to them. We're not going to pander to them. And that's the way I think about what we're doing and hopefully other companies like us is we're going to treat you like adults. Even if that means it's a less sexy computer that does less, but it means you can do more. I admire your work for making it line up with the real human experience and use it as the tool that, that it is. Not the little slave machine that has us currently. Slave machine. Seriously. 
That's true. Because that's one thing, like, we have talked about over and over over the past couple of years, like, in many episodes, which is the balance of life and then life itself and the real human experience. And we like to bunk things that people are arguing about, which just make no sense. And, like, my backing of philosophy is that, listen, at the end of the day, everybody came out of the womb and things happened to them that caused their brain to think in a certain bubble or whatever it was. And if you really think about it, we're just humans. And I feel like within the human experience, um, we're, we're taking a lot of the experience out. The true human experience. Yeah. I find, I find a lot of things today to be mechanical. Like the spirit has been stripped away from it. It's, it's gone. It's like, yeah. That's well, a huge problem. And I, I guess like... Well, what I really wanted to ask you actually is what – can you speak on anything from a, a prototype perspective? Can you speak on anything new that you have? I know that you mentioned the phone, <laughs> laptop potentially. Is there anything that's really exciting for you on that end? A lot. I mean I have to be careful here because if this tablet doesn't succeed, then all of the rest of this is fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> and uh, believe it or not, the iPad actually came out before the iPhone – they just released the iPhone publicly first because they were worried about iPods being uh, cannibalized by phones being able to do MP3. So they needed mm. to come out with their own phone. Mm. So there's an interesting way that certain personal computing paradigms start with a fat piece of paper, what a tablet is. And you can miniaturize it down and you make a phone. Making things smaller is more expensive because everything needs to be more custom. You make it a little bit bigger and make it into a monitor. Making things bigger is a little bit more expensive. And you can add some mechanicals through to it to make it into a laptop, a hinge, and a keyboard and a trackpad, which makes it a little more expensive. So to be honest, we've done the hard technical execution risk of developing the screen technology, of putting together a humane OS. Clearly, the screen technology is the real big invention here, and the flicker-free, pure amber, no blue light, black light, and you know a variety of things like that. Um, so we can scale it up and down, make a watch, make a phone, make a monitor in this. But all roads lead through Rome, and Rome is being cash flow positive and hitting the minimum order quantity on this first tablet. But mm. um, yeah, if you uh, if you got me a bit inebriated and you started to ask me about this, <laughs> I would rant to you about the phone because to me that's how we change the world. Is especially in the form factor like a Galaxy Fold, where it's a it's like a moleskin journal, but it can fold in half and fit in your pocket. I think the possibility of that is so tremendous because what it means is you now, when you're bored on a train, rather than having your iPhone in your right pocket, you take this out of your left pocket and you can read something. You can listen to something. It's like you have an environment where the path of least resistance is better quality consumption. Um, I don't think you're going to have people completely change their behavior, but I, I like to call it the, the Tolstoy on the airplane effect. Uh, if there is no Wi-Fi and there's no good movies to watch, suddenly that seemingly boring Tolstoy book in your backpack starts to get interesting. And before you know it, on that six-hour flight, you've read half the book. Good luck doing that in your apartment back home. Yeah, this is No <laughs> chance. It's a good idea. But. <laughs> did, did, did you change? Did you get more willpower? Did you get more disciplined? No, you simply designed your environment such that the path least resistance versus boredom was in your favor. And so I think the possibility of you don't bring your iPhone into your bedroom, you bring in this phone and that's how you do your alarms. It syncs, we, we, we come out with a morning alarm clock. I think the possibility of building morning routines uh, around a, a healthy set of appliances, call them computers, uh, night routines, the possibility of getting more people to wake up with the sun and not wake up with a sound yelling at you and increasing your cortisol more than it is. I think those are the products I get really excited about is... Uh, a distraction-free healthy phone and the possibility of helpful computing in your house and in your bedroom that helps you keep your sleep hygiene and help you build really useful morning and night routines. And I think the difference between living a spiritual life and a non-spiritual life, the difference between living an agentic life and not, is just that little bit of space every morning and every night for you to want the things you want to want, to reflect on the things of like why you did what you did the little space to be devoted to whatever your devotion is, um, a little bit of exercise, a little bit of this. And um, I think that's how we reclaim our sovereignty, that little bit of space every morning and night. And uh, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. I'm working so hard. I don't have the best morning 
overnight routines, but hopefully that humanizes the nature of the problem that this is hard and we're going to have to work together and share our wisdoms and create technologies um, to do so. And I'm not even convinced technologies are the most important part of it, but it's going to be a start. Yeah, we always talk about how we love the fireplace. Oh, yeah. And camping. I mean, that's what we call it, the camping effect. And I feel like the daily life should be very similar to that, you know? Because we don't use our, our senses fully. It's all being occupied by this stupid tablet or phone, mostly the phone. The camping effect is you come back from camping and you're like, wow. Mm. A couple of days later, you're like, I haven't been checking my notifications as much. I mean, you're back into reality, but it's... And then over that course of uh, a week or two, some important things happen on that phone. And then all of a sudden you're back into it. You know, you're either scrolling, you're starting to read on your phone, um, checking emails on your phone. There's no, there's no split environment. Everything's on this stupid thing in your pocket. Mm. And it sucks. It just sucks the life out of you. Well, at least we have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, what's your favorite part of the daylight computer? Or favorite aspect? I think it's it's two things. One is it helps me not self-sabotage as much. And two is it gives me um, something to fall back onto. Uh, like what do I mean by that is it's too easy for me to use my iPad at night because I got blue blockers on and then I itch my eyes and I take the blue blockers on off and the next thing you know, it's like 2 a.m. and I'm still on my computer. So the fact that with this, like it's just so much harder to self-sabotage. I've started to build routines where, you know, when it's at nighttime and I can say say goodbye to work, this is the only computer I'm allowed to use. So it's not even about what can I do on it. It's like, well, if you want to use a computer, here you go. And there's just something about that shift from like work mode to like a wind down nighttime mode that this, the amber, the fact that we made it out of alpaca wool and merino wool, it just, it just is a different feel from what you have during the day. It's a softer on your nervous system feel so much harder for me to sabotage that wind down at nighttime. Um, even if I'm reading an article or this or that, it's just on this substrate. Uh, I'm outside in the park using a magic keyboard writing on this. It's so much harder for me to go when I get word blocked and waste two hours on ESPN. I don't got internet. Yeah. It's essentially a typewriter. I can't sabotage myself the same way. It doesn't need to do more for me to do more. The fact that it does less is like half of the value. The fact that I can't have my monkey brain get in the way or sabotage myself. Um, so I think that's my favorite part of it is I can create in it environments where I don't self-sabotage. And then the whole um, fail-safe aspect of it is that let's say there's a boring contract I need to read and I keep procrastinating it and I don't want to do it and my eyes hurt reading it on a computer and it feels shit. I treat this almost like a digital printout where all that stuff that's like good for me but I kind of procrastinate, I shoot all of it onto the tablet. And then what I do is then I go to the nearby coffee shop only with this tablet, not with my laptop or anything. Sorry. And um, I turn it on and the only things on it are all this stuff that I'm like good for me to do, that contract. And suddenly picking your nose gets boring after a while and you start reading it. (laughs) It's that whole Tolstoy on the airplane effect. And so... Previously, it would just be like scary. I was just like, ah, okay, I'm just going to procrastinate this forever and forever and forever. I'm super ADHD and I struggle with procrastination. Now with this, all I need to do is I don't need to make the hard decision of oh, I'm going to read this and I'm going to start this. I just pick it up and decide to leave my thing instead of in my pocket with my iPhone. I leave it in my backpack or I leave it back home or whatever it is. Add some friction. Mm-hmm. And then I'm able to be a better version of myself. And so... It's not like I use this thing every day religiously. That's what I expected. I'm like, this thing's going to solve all my problems. It turns out, not yet, not yet. But the fact it's able to give me this safety that I'm not going to sabotage myself, this safety that I can have a relationship to computing that is finite, that I can sit down with and know that what I'm going to do is in alignment with my intention. Ooh, that gives me so much of my self-esteem back. Yeah. Can you show this bad boy off? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm itching. I'm Ooh. dying to see it. Yeah, tricky. So what, what what we could do is we could show it off, but we're we're being a little shy about showing off the fast refresh rate sure thing, on, sure on thing. camera. One thing we could do too is I, if there's a way to video 
your faces or something. I could show it to you, but you can't see the screen on camera. Okay. Hopefully everybody else gets to Probably see Probably do that after. Reactions. Yeah, yeah, I can edit it yeah, after. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. You have any last questions? Honestly, I just admire you, your work, um, everything you're about, your drive. Um, it seems like for once in my life, I can say that we have a guest that we have hope in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no offense to any of the other ones, but... <laughs> Um, I think it's what you're doing is amazing and it kind of is like Van Gogh's story where it isn't might not be built for last year or the year before that or even now, but it could be built for another time. You know what I mean? And that I don't think that's a in a negative way because when it is the thing, it's gonna dominate. I wholeheartedly believe that. I think so. One of my dreams is to use a computer in the sun so I can two birds, one stone it, honestly. That'd be cool. Yeah. I love how deep you went into it. I mean, we didn't even talk about the the tech so much, but just like <laughs> your background and the story and and the way you've you've thought about these things, I think is the real quote unquote selling point for people. Because you could talk about the tech all day. At the like people want to connect with the human level. So I, I admire all your work and I, I think it's going to be a smashing success and we'll definitely be pushing it out. And I, I so appreciate once again, um, you guys willing to engage with us. It's been six years in the shadows as a company called Daylight, right? And so there's the vulnerability of, will anybody like this? Is it going to work? Is it going to, was I crazy this whole time? And so I think there's no way that we don't succeed now. Or a better way to say it is if I'm able to get in front of folks like yourself and somebody at Apple is a little bit more like has like an argument to be like, guys, let's make this next version of the iPad flicker free. I think we succeed. I don't think our company or our product needs to succeed. It's if more people in society say, okay, this matters. And the boring folks in these big companies, which whether we like it or not, do run the world, actually actually care about this value system around health and well-being. actually care about the principles that we're trying to teach. And so I'm just excited about that, this being a movement. And, you know, if nothing else, we're a great marketing campaign to get it even further, so be it. And, um, yeah, I'm just excited to see where we take this. We wholeheartedly agree. And with that, Anjan Kata. Is that how you say your name? Yeah, Anjan Kata. Perfect. Anjin I love Kata. the name. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, man. Thank you for coming on. It's been a, it's been a you know, incredible episode. I didn't expect it to be this deep. So thank you. No, I love it. Yeah. Awesome guys. Uh, go ahead and follow us at the 2am podcast. We're available on Twitter at 2am pod. We also submit videos on this website called YouTube. Go ahead and check them out. <laughs> we'll have all your links as well. Cool. Yeah. Daylight computer. Daylight computer. For pre-order. Yeah. Daylightcomputer.com for pre-order. We're going to launch in May. So you're your folks are going to be some of the first people to find out about us. But you can go to daylightcomputer.com and put a pre-order down. For Perfect. A deposit that's fully refundable. Guys, All links below. Go ahead and do that. We will catch you guys next time. Peace. Later.